Welcome, dear friends, to today's session. Uh, today's session is a special one uh, in the sense that uh, we are celebrating Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine's 30 glorious years and success is the theme. So today being ICCM day, we are going to have a special webinar on sepsis. And the precise topic is uh, current controversies in sepsis. And uh, for our Young India Intensivist Forum, this is webinar number 134. So if you have any questions, I will take them in the end. So these are the contents uh, of the lecture. We'll be discussing controversies regarding <clears throat> albumin, fluids, blood purification, delirium, antibiotic steroids, and metabolic acidosis. So first, <clears throat> we talk about albumin in sepsis. So you all probably know the current recommendations in the sepsis 4 guidelines when to use albumin. So albumin is recommended if there is a large volume of crystalloid utilization. There is no other indication for albumin. But do we have any other indication? Can we use albumin in any other way? Does it help? So let us see. So way back in 2004, this meta-analysis was done by the great uh, intensivist, one of the foremost intensivists, Jean-Louis Vincent from Belgium. And this meta-analysis uh, looked at 71 trials where albumin was used, out of which 32 trials, only albumin versus no albumin was used. And you can see this favors albumin in terms of decreased morbidity and mortality over patients where no albumin was used. The population was a mixed population of surgery, burns, trauma, uh, sepsis, all kinds of patients, critically ill patients were there. And uh, Dr. Winston recommended that albumin reduces morbidity in broad populations of acutely ill hospitalized patients. In many randomized trials, this effect has been masked by concomitant albumin administered to the control group. Just around the same time, there was another analysis of hypoalbuminemia and acute illness. So this looked at the levels of albumin. And as the albumin level dropped, there was increased mortality in critically ill patients, not necessarily sepsis. Sepsis was part of the group of patients. So he finally said there is no compelling basis to withhold albumin therapy if it is just clinically appropriate. Now, at that uh, time, the SAFE study was done in 2004, and now we have the Albio study in 2001-04, which are the landmark studies in albumin. So this is directly picked up from what the Albio study said. And you can see it says from the SAFE study, which suggested a survival advantage with an albumin-based strategy during sepsis. This never reached you know, statistical significance, but there was a suggestion that in severe sepsis, <coughs> albumin was beneficial. And similar beneficial effects were also suggested by a large meta-analysis done at that time. So further on, he says in 1,021 patients with septic shock, they showed significant lower mortality at 90 days in the albumin group than in the crystalloid group. And the clinical benefit of albumin that was seen in the post-hoc analysis of the subgroup of patients with septic shock warrants further confirmation. So both the SAFE and the Albio study, there was a trend towards improved survival in sepsis and septic shock patients. And uh, for those of you who have read Albio study properly, there was definite hemodynamic improvement with the administration of albumin. They reached their hemodynamic targets faster in the first 24 to 48 hours. So what are the beneficial effects of albumin apart from its oncotic properties or the hemodynamic properties? So it has binding transport and detoxification properties. It has antioxidant properties. 
endothelial stabilization, hemostatic effects, regulation of extracellular pH, and modulation of immunological and inflammatory responses. So there are many pleiotropic effects for albumin, and these are supposed to be beneficial in sepsis and in critical illnesses. So now this is a very important study, and this has come from India. It was published this year in European Journal of Hepatology. And uh, the study population was patients of CLD who had septis and septic shock. This is known as a FISH study. And in this uh, study, they gave 5% uh, albumin as a resuscitative fluid versus crystalloids in the control group. And it was seen that when you gave albumin, there was improved hemodynamics, increased lactate clearance, and uh, most importantly, there was increased short-term survival. The mortality was less at a follow-up at discharge. So this is a very important study showing clear benefit of albumin in septic shock with early administration. And they are given 5% albumin. Now again, this is 2022. This is a retrospective analysis of 2,000 patients. And <clears throat> here again, they have shown that uh, in those patients uh, where albumin was given, the hospital discharge with clinical stability increased by 83% and median time to discharge was 13 versus 17 days. So again, early administration of albumin was shown to help in this retrospective analysis. Again, another retrospective analysis, this is published in 2021, and this shows that, again, albumin is helpful if given in the first 24 hours especially. So they had uh, 6597 patients in which crystalloids were given, and 922 patients in which both crystalloids and albumin was given, and in septic patients receiving albumin combined within the first 24 hours after crystalloid administration, it was associated with an increment of survival at 28 days. The modality difference was 12.5 versus 16.4%. And uh, this is the forest plot. And as you can see here, at 28 days follow-up time, early combination distinctly had a survival benefit. And late combination of albumin with crystalloid also had some benefit, but less. And at 60 days, this uh, benefit was even more. So there's enough data to suggest that if you give albumin early, especially in the first 24 hours, <clears throat> along with crystalloids or without crystalloids, then it has a lot of benefit. This trial is now planned to assess the benefit of albumin if you give it early in septic shock patients. So what would be the takeaway from this? So my suggestion is that we should use albumin early in the first 24 hours, and it probably leads to better outcomes in sepsis in view of the recent data. And this data has always been there, but it never reached statistical significance, but it has uh, gained a lot of strength in the recent publications. However, we should not give it in tr uh, traumatic brain injury, as we all know from the SAFE study. And especially if the patient has leaky lungs, then don't give 20%, because 20% is hyper-oncotic, and it can lead to leakage into the lungs. And especially in cardiac patients also, we have to be cautious. 5% is kind of safe. And even the FRISC study, which I showed you, they used 5% and they repeated the study with 20%. And there were a lot of complications, pulmonary complications, when they used 20%. Now coming to fluids. <clears throat> so <clears throat> a lot of... Uh, Buzz has been created around fluids, you know, how much fluids should be given as resuscitation fluids. What should be the volume? So what does sepsis 4 say? Sepsis 4 says that uh, 30 ml per kg of intravenous crystalloid fluid should be given in the first three hours of resuscitation. Now let us look at what the other people have to say and where this 30 ml came from, first of all. So the 30 ml per kg actually has very weak evidence. Okay, and uh, in 2000, Rivers et al. published their early goal-directed therapy in NEGM and they use a lot of fluids, even more than 30 ml per kg. And because it was such a successful trial, it went on and on and still goes on at 30 ml per kg. However, people in 2017 started looking 
at uh, data and uh, seeing whether lesser amount of fluids may be beneficial. And these studies did show that uh, lesser fluids were better than giving uh, 30 ml per kg or large amount of fluids. And now in 2023, two, there have been some studies like the Clover's trial and the classic trial, and there have been recommendations from experts about how much fluid we should be giving. So this is the classic trial published last year in New England Journal of Medicine. And this was actually restriction of intravenous fluids. There were two groups. In one group, they used the usual strategy of giving fluids. In the other, they restricted the fluids. So as you can see, uh, in the day one, the, the amount of fluid given the restricted group is 500, while 1300 is given in the usual strategy group. But if you look at the total fluid volume administered after five days, there's hardly any difference. And both these groups had already received three liters pre-randomization. So actually, there's not much of a difference in terms of the fluid given in both the groups. And at the end of the day, there was no difference in modality. Both the groups had similar modality. And this group was followed up. That is, both these groups were followed up for one year. And this was published in Intensive Care Medicine very recently. And they found there was no difference at all between the two groups, the restrictive strategy and the normal strategy groups. The one-year mortality was the same, 51.3 versus 49.9. Health-related quality of life was the same. And cognitive function was the same. So there is no difference between these two groups as far as the... Uh, fluid administration is given, but like I showed you, there was not much of a difference between the fluids administered in the two groups. Now, there was another trial now, Clover's trial, which was published this year. And in this, there were two groups. In one, they restricted the fluids, and the other, they used liberal fluids. So here, there was somewhat of a difference in the sense only two liters was given pre-randomization. And at six hours, uh, the restricted strategy received 500 and the liberal strategy group received 2,300. And the use of vasopressors was 59% in the restrictive strategy group and 37% in the liberal strategy group. And what they found was, again, there was no difference at 24 hours and further follow. Uh, <clears throat> very important actually here is that the SOFA score was only four. The SOFA score was only four in these uh, two groups. And uh, when the SOFA score is so less, and the use of vasopressors is also so less, the patients were not very sick. And if the patients are not very sick, then the difference would be meted out. So again, uh, you know, this was not that good a trial. Both these trials had their flaws. And there was no difference in modality between the restrictive strategy and the liberal strategy in these groups. So what is to be done with fluids? Considering the fact there have been a lot of trials showing that less fluids is better, and we know that giving too much fluids causes a lot of problems. So the recommendations from the other experts is to individualize fluid therapy. So <clears throat> this was uh, published in Critical Care in 2021 after uh, the sepsis guidelines were published. And again, the lead author is John Louis Vincent, one of the leading experts. And this group recommended individualizing fluid resuscitation. No single formula can be applied to all patients as fluid requirements vary substantially depending on the source of sepsis and pre-existing cardiovascular function. This is particularly true for the suggestion to give at least 30 ml per kg of fluid within the first three hours. A young patient without comorbidities is more likely to tolerate administration of large volume of fluid than a fragile elderly patient with severe cardiac or renal disease. So, you know, one has to individualize uh, fluid therapy. Most patients do not require so much fluid, but some patients they may actually require more fluids also. And uh, the question of cardiac patients and patients with CKD comes into play. Cardiac patients have to be definitely given less fluids, slower fluids, as do have to be, as uh, the renal patients also have to be given in a similar fashion. So how do you personalize or individualize fluid therapy in septic shock? So this is an uh, picked up from an article by uh, Xavier Mone and uh, Dr. Jean-Louis Tiboul, who are the experts in fluid therapy 
fluid resuscitation and in their recommendation they have suggested <coughs> give around 10 ml per kg of crystalloids within 30 to 60 minutes and if uh, the patient has evident fluid losses like nausea vomiting or there's abdominal origin of sepsis because abdominal origin leads to larger losses or if there's high fever if there's mottling increased capillary refill time low arterial pulse pressure then you give faster fluids and more fluids so this is the way to individualize and uh, after giving so much fluid then you check for preload responsiveness so the idea is to give lesser fluids initially because all patients do not require that much fluids and you then check for preload responsiveness and go ahead with more fluids if required now coming to antibiotics and steroids so recently a trial was published in hydrocortisone in severe community acquired pneumonia in new england journal of medicine known as the cape cod trial uh, with by dequin et al so what did this trial show this trial was done in patients of severe bacterial pneumonia and these patients had a pf of less than 300 or were on mechanical ventilation or had a fi2 of requirement of more than 50 percent you know all of them were not on mechanical ventilation some were on high flow some were on you know, fhnc etc etc but they were sick patients with severe pneumonia then they gave IV hydrocortisone 200 milligram per day for four to seven days and then tapered off as per the clinical situation. And they found a decreased mortality, 11% versus 6%, and there was a decreased rate of intubation. Uh, <clears throat> other steroids can also probably be used, as has been seen in many steroid trials. And they excluded patients of TB, influenza, fungal infections, and other contraindications to steroids. Now, should we be giving corticosteroids in uh, patients with severe pneumonia? This has always been controversial, and the American Thoracic Society does not recommend it. This is actually a meta-analysis of the famous trials uh, of steroids in pneumonia, severe pneumonia. As you and can see that uh, it favors the administration of steroids in pneumonia. So what does the European guidelines say? So the European guidelines says that we suggest the use of steroids if shock is present in patients with pneumonia. However, this was published just one month after the NEGM trial with the Cape Cod trial. So what is to be done? Should we give giving uh, patients <clears throat> this thing, steroids or not? So I think looking at all the evidence, especially at the meta-analysis, there is no harm in giving steroids in patients with severe pneumonia provided you rule out the contraindications now another look at the role of steroids in septic shock patients so this is a trial of hydrocortisone plus fludrocortisone we all know that hydrocortisone is given to patients with septic shock and it helps in faster resolution of septic shock but what about fludrocortisone which comes as fluoricot so fludrocortisone was always there uh, in the guidelines earlier till 2012. After that, because of poor evidence, it was removed from the guidelines. There was a recommendation earlier to give fludrocortisone. So this was actually published in NEGM. And when they gave hydrocortisone plus fludrocortisone, the time to weaning from vasopressors was faster. The time to weaning from mechanical ventilation was faster. And time to a decline in SOFA score less than six was faster. And uh, that was in 2018. And now very recently in any in JAMA, this was published, comparative effectiveness of fludrocortisone and hydrocortisone versus hydrocortisone alone. And this was a retrospective analysis. They saw hydrocort only in around 8,000 and sorry, 85,000 patients. And in 2,280 patients, uh, they saw fludrocortisone and hydrocortisone. And it was seen that there was a lower 90-day mortality at discharge and lower rate of hospital death and fewer days on vasopressors. So definitely this points towards giving fludrocortisone along with hydrocortisone. So how does fludrocortisone help actually? So fludrocortisone actually has been shown to act via certain receptors on the vascular muscles. Experimental sepsis studies show marked NF 
kappa beta mediated down regulation of vascular mineralocorticoid receptors and earlier on a mineralocorticoid receptor agonist restored alpha 1 adrenergic receptor expression improved contractile response to phenylephrine and improved survival in mice with endotoxic shock so fludrocortisone as you may know is a mineralocorticoid so it up regulates the receptors and there's increased vascular re responsiveness all steroids actually or most steroids actually have some mineralocorticoid activity even hydrocortisone has some mineralocorticoid activity though primarily it is a glucocorticoid but fludrocortisone is an exclusive mineralocorticoid so give steroids for severe pneumonia and give hydrocortisone with fludrocortisone for septic shock now what are the side effects of fludrocortisone so fludrocortisone can lead to more water retention so sodium and water retention and it can cause uh, hyperkalemia so here one has to be very careful if these are other situations then you should avoid fludrocortisone now looking at uh, covid pneumonia so just a quick uh, recap here there's nothing controversial but since we were talking about steroids and pneumonia i thought i'll share this slide so dexamethasone uh, is the drug of choice or other steroid of choice for patients who are on supplemental oxygen or ventilatory support and six milligram daily for 10 days or until discharge whichever is shorter can use other glucocorticoids at equivalent doses and can also be used for refractory shock. Now about antibiotics. So certain uh, nice uh, journal articles have been published about the use of antibiotics in sepsis. So what is the effectiveness of septazidim, abibactam versus cholesterol in treating carbapenem resistant enterobacteriacemia, bacteremia? So here it was seen there was a lower risk of mortality with septazidim Avibactam versus cholesterol in CRE bacteremia. Ciftazidim avibactam had a clinical response versus cholesterol in CRE bacteremia. Now, this is another trial, the Mercy trial, where we saw continuous versus intermittent meropenem administration in critical EL patients with sepsis. You know, meropenem is a time dependent antibiotic, that is, at least 40% of the times, the serum levels of meropenem have to be above the MIC to have effective killing. And a lot of studies have looked at the time above MIC and some suggestion was there that greater the time above MIC, greater the log killing of the bacteria. And there was suggestion in literature that if you achieved 100% time above MIC, you may get better results. Thereby, this study, because by giving continuous meropenem administration, we tried to achieve a time of MIC as close as possible to 100%. So what did this study show? This study show that if you gave continuous versus intermittent, there was no difference in the outcomes. So intermittent was given as bolus shots, eight hourly, one gram or two gram, depending on the situation. And continuous was given as a 24 hour infusion. So, looking at this study, it does not help to give continuous 24-hour meropenem infusions. Now, coming to empirical antibiotic cover for staff, is it justified? You see, when a patient comes to our ICU, there is a tendency to start gram-negative cover and along with that, ticoplanin or vancomycin. But uh, we should be aware that the incidence of staff in our country is very low as compared to the West. The Western guidelines recommend staff cover uh, in the literature because staph is very common. Staph is 40% of their community acquired infections and even in the nosocomial infections. But staph in our studies is only 10% of the total ICU infections. So what do the sepsis uh, guidelines say? So the sepsis guidelines recommend using empiric antibiotics with MRSA coverage without MRSA coverage who are at high risk. And for adults with sepsis or septic shock at low risk of MRSA, we suggest against using empiric antimicrobials with MRSA coverage. So they do not recommend empiric coverage when the risk is low because it has led to detrimental outcomes. And uh, there's a tendency, at least in Indian ICUs, <coughs> to use empirical uh, vancomycin or ticoplanin. 
So what are the high risk factors for MRSA or staph? Severe diabetes mellitus, maintenance hemodialysis, toxic shock syndrome, burns, skin disorders, immunocompromised or immunodeficient patients, chronic multi-organ disease like CLD, CKD, necrotizing pneumonia, and abscesses. So if you are having these situations, then you are justified in using upfront uh, staff. You can use uh, staff cover. But empiric uh, usage of vancomycin or ticoplanin is not justified in Indian ICUs. Now, this is another study uh, <clears throat> for antibiotics. And this compared the effect of piperacillin tazobactam versus meropenem on 30-day mortality for patients of E. coli or Klebsiella who had bloodstream infection and were ciftriaxone resistance. So ciftriaxone resistance means the, the bugs are ESBL. So here again, you know, if the patient has ESBL organisms, gram-negative organisms, <clears throat> do you go in with piperacillin tazobactam or meropenem if culture sensitivity is showing sensitivity to both? That is the questionnaire. So the results were in favor of meropenem. There was a higher mortality if you gave piperacillin tazobactam even if it was sensitive. So the message here is use meropenem in such situations. <clears throat> now coming to blood purification. So blood purification in sepsis has been around for 30 years and we still do not have an answer. So we do not have an answer because we do not know what to remove and when to use it precisely, how long to use it, and we do not know how exactly it works. These are the problems with blood purification. So these are all the molecules which are floating around in the blood during sepsis. Dams, spams, antibiotics, hormones, and uh, anti-inflammatory, pro-inflammatory molecules. So a lot of things get removed over which we do not have control and which may be beneficial to the patient, including antibiotics. Now, what do the trials say? So the most relevant trial was the Euphoridary trial, which was published way back in 2016. And this looked at two 440 adult patients, which had an endotoxin level greater than 0.6. And the results of this trial were interesting in the fact that there was no mortality benefit, but uh, it showed hemodynamic improvement. Later on, a subgroup analysis was done of this trial, and it showed that when the endotoxin level was between 0.6 and 0.9, there was a distinct mortality benefit. So if you can measure the endotoxin level between 0.6 and 0.9, you will likely get mortality benefit if you use a polymyxin filter. Now, this was a study published in 2021, and again, they used a polymyxin filter, and patients of sepsis were again stratified, and they saw, and as you can see, SOFA score 10 to 12, and SOFA score 7 to 9, there's a distinct mortality benefit. And this showed that the endotoxin level of 0.6 to 0.9 correlated with the SOFA score of 7 to 12. So even if your lab is not doing endotoxin levels, which most of the labs do not do, then if the SOFA score is between 7 to 12, you are probably justified in using polymyxin filter. So that is probably the way to go about with polymyxin filters. However, having said that, it is important to realize there are negative trials also. So this was published in 2021 with the Cytosoft filter. And as you can see, there is a distinct increase in modality. There's an increase in modality here. Now a word about this filter, Seraph filter. This is a new filter which has been given FDA approval last year. And it's a unique filter in the sense that the filter consists of porous beads to which heparin is attached. And this heparin actually is able to bind to the circulating bacteria, viruses, and then these get removed by the filter. So in a way, you know, it decreases the total load of bacteremia or viremia. So this is a very interesting filter. And let us see how it performs in the coming trials. And apart from removing the bacteria and the viruses from the 
blood, uh, it also removes the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So what are the recommendations for the use of blood purification techniques? So the sepsis for guidelines suggest not to use these blood purification techniques. However, Dr. Claudio Ronco, who is the leading expert in RRT and such techniques, recommends that the results of Euphrates confirm the unequivocal benefit of use of polymyxin filter in improving hemodynamics in patients with endotoxic septic shock. Euphrates also suggests an important mortality benefit for this treatment when targeted to patients with endotoxin SA 0.6 to 0.9 in endotoxemic septic shock, reflecting the growing trends towards a personalized medicine approach to disease management. Further trials are needed to better evaluate the potential use of this therapy in other forms of endotoxin-mediated illnesses. So uh, that is the recommendation and that is probably how we should be using it. Now coming to metabolic acidosis. So we all have been using soda bicarb for metabolic acidosis, especially when the pH is less than 7.2, 7.15. But does it help to give uh, soda bicarb? So surprisingly, till the year 2018, there was no study looking at the outcome of giving soda bicarb in metabolic acidosis. Still, this bicarb ICU study was done. And this bicarb ICU study was the first last study to examine the clinical outcome of soda bicarb in metabolic acidosis. And 50% of the patients had sepsis. And they saw that there was a decreased mortality at day 28 in the subset who had AKI stage 2 and 3. And there was a decreased need for RRT also. However, in the entire cohort of metabolic acidosis, there was no difference in outcome. And currently, Bicar ICU 2 study is going on. And what are the recommendations of sepsis 4? So, sepsis 4 guidelines say that in lactic acidosis, they suggest against using soda bicarbonate. While they suggest for septic shock with severe metabolic acidosis and AKI stage 2 3 they recommend the use of soda bicarb. Now, why does soda bicarb not help in lactic acidosis from whatever studies we have? So what happens is when you give soda bicarb, it combines with uh, the hydrogen ions to give carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide levels go up in the blood and there's a diffusion gradient between the blood and the cell. The cell carbon dioxide levels are generally low so carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood to the cells, raising the intracellular pH. And this is especially important when the circulation is impaired or when the ventilation is impaired, when you're unable to blow out your carbon dioxide. So the intracellular pH rises, which is detrimental to the functioning of the cells. At the same time, there's a rise of blood pH, which causes hypocalcemia. And hypocalcemia is important for contractility of the heart, and for maintaining vascular tone, which are both impaired in metabolic acidosis. And when you give acid, when you give uh, alkali, there's increased production of lactic acid also because there are changes in the biochemistry. At the same time, there is hypervolemia and hypernatremia. So, what to do with lactic acidosis? So, the recommendation of experts is that one should go ahead with dialysis. This is an expert opinion and correct the underlying cause. Now coming to the last part, treating delirium. So now delirium is an enema in the sense that we are unable to treat delirium. And delirium is widely prevalent. We do not pick it up because most patients have hypoactive, not hyperactive. Hyperactive is very easy to pick up. But hypoactive delirium is very difficult to pick up because the patient is lying in the bed. Unless one actually goes into the patient's mind in the sense of doing a CAM ICU or assessing in any other way, one does not diagnose hypoactive delirium. So these trials, MIND in 2010 and now AIDS ICU currently in 2022 have all looked at antipsychotics, especially haloperidol and delirium, but they are all been negative trials.
there has been some uh, decreased incidence of delirium with the use of risperidone or dexam in small studies, <clears throat> especially when given prophylactically in surgical patients. Now, very important to us is the Paris guidelines for pain, agitation, sedation, and delirium. So the Paris guidelines say that despite reduction in delirium in certain studies, no study has reported a statistically significant or clinically meaningful difference for any of the other outcomes that the group deemed critical. And they recommend only DEX for control of agitated state. They do not recommend any antipsychotic or any other drug. And of course, one has to use non-pharmacological methods. At the same time, apart from the role of DEX in controlling the agitated state, it becomes important to realize that DEX is associated with less delirium than benzodiazepines and propofol. So whenever the situation exists, one should go ahead with DEX rather than propofol and benzodiazepine. Now this was about melatonin, the sleep-inducing hormone, and this is a very large Australian trial, ProMedic, published last year. And again, they showed no benefit with prophylactic melatonin. Melatonin, incidentally, has not been found to have any side effects. So melatonin may be tried, you know, in patients who have who are having delirium. And uh, a large meta-analysis for melatonin or remelton was conducted, and it said that the evidence is very weak. We can't really comment on melatonin and remelton use in prophylactic or therapeutic delirium. So at the end of the day, what do you do with delirium? So if there is hyperactive or agitated delirium, use haloperidol or dex, and melatonin may be tried for <coughs> hypoactive and hyperactive delirium. So what is the take-home message? After having gone through all these existing controversies, so give albumin upfront in septic shock. How much albumin? So the usual recommendation is one should target three grams per deciliter, but uh, that may require a lot of albumin. Depending on your resources, give as much as you can, especially within the first 24 hours. Then individualize fluid volume for resuscitation, something like 10 to 15 ml per kg initially, and then individualize with preload responsiveness. Then hydrocort may be given for severe pneumonia, 200 milligrams per day. Then you may add fludrocortisone, 50 microgram, to hydrocortisone for septic shock. Polymixin filter may be used for a SOFA score of 7 to 12 or an endotoxin level assay showing 0 0.6 to 0.9 value if your lab is doing it. Give soda bicarb for AKI stage 2, stage 3 and dialysis for lactic acidosis. Dex or haloperidol for acute agitated delirium and melatonin for hypo or hyperactive delirium. So those were the controversies existing. Some of the controversies, and there are many more controversies, and controversies will always be there. One has to look at the literature and the physiology and the science behind it and chart one's own path in treating the patients. Thank you. So I'm happy to take any questions that may be there. So please post your questions if you have any.